Hello and welcome to another edition of Deeper. It is so good to have you join us for this. As you probably know by now, Deeper is our kind of exploration of the passage that we look at on Sunday and just try and go a little bit deeper and a bit wider with it. Uh, and so I would love you to read the passage that we looked at on Sunday. And that passage is Numbers uh, chapter 21, verses 1 to 9. So do please press pause and read that passage now. Fantastic. So, uh, as you'll know, we are looking at uh, the story, or some of the stories anyway, of what it was like for the Israelites as they wandered the desert for 40 years. Uh, and we've looked at some really interesting passages, um, but some of the passages that we haven't looked at yet, uh, that we're looking at today, uh, are some of the more difficult ones. Because quite often throughout this uh, passage of time, God brings judgment on the Israelites. Because uh, we've already seen how much they grumble. I mean, that is a common theme throughout. If you look at, uh, you know, kind of from Exodus uh, into Numbers, it's a common theme. I think this story within Numbers, it's the eighth time that they've grumbled. Uh, and quite often there is judgment aligned with that as well. Um, and we don't always like those passages, do we? And yet that's what we have here. And effectively, the passage we have is two stories. First of all, uh, about a battle with the king of Arad, and then the story of them grumbling. Uh, so uh, let's just look at um, this whole passage, verses 1 to 9, and uh, just draw out some of the things in it. Uh, the context is that um, this passage probably takes place almost 40 years after they had sent the spies into the promised land to, to check it out. So this is almost a new generation of Israelites. And that's something just to bear in mind as we go through this passage. Um, and so they are kind of skirting the edge of the promised land. If you look into the previous chapter, what you'll see is that they uh, tried to uh, go across the land that belongs to the king of Edom. And they asked for permission for that. And he declined. And I guess with good reason, you really wouldn't want over a million people, you know, in a convoy going across your land, taking up valuable resources, uh, taking your water, uh, their livestock, eating your grazing pastures, all those kind of things. So um, they said, no, it would have been a threat. You know, if you've got over a million people coming through, it's, it's yeah, it's threatening, isn't it? Uh, and so he doesn't give them permission. And so they are starting to skirt around and, and where they are at the moment, um, they are almost into the promised land. So they're touching that kind of skirt, they're skirting that area. Arad is probably about 40 miles south of Jerusalem and where the battle takes place that we read about is probably around about another 40 miles south of that as well. So um, it's a little way further down. And so Quite easily, Israel could have just decided to go through um, Eden, but decided not to. They are simply skirting the land. Uh, and so in verse one, what we see is, uh, is this convoy of over a million people are, are kind of skirting the, this area that belongs to the king of Arad. He decides to simply attack and to take a whole group of people hostage. Uh, and then verse two, there's something significant happens. The thing that we need to know is that 38 years earlier, around about that time, uh, the, there had been another battle in exactly the same place. Because that, this is where they were when they sent these spies into the land. They decided to, to go in and to check out what the land was like. And of course, the spies come back and say, it's great, but it's filled with giants. And then the people decide to not enter the land. And uh, if you read in Numbers 14, you'll see this conversation between the people of Moses and God. And uh, uh, what happens is that God tells Moses, and he, and he then tells the people, God's decided you're not entering the promised land then. You, your generation, will not enter the land. And the people get a bit uptight about this. You'll see in around about verses 45 onwards. Uh, that they decide now to go into the land and to try and conquer it without the permission and without the blessing of God. And Moses tells them, what are you doing this for? <laughs> You'll surely not succeed. God is not with you. Uh, and uh, in fact, he says, do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You'll be defeated by your enemies. 
Regardless of that, the people decide to try and enter the land and conquer it on their own. And of course, they are roundly defeated. And that's in pretty much the same place in the passage as describes how they come across the uh, Amalekites and the Canaanites. And that is the king of Arad and all those kind of places around there. So this is a kind of new generation in the same place with the same kind of concern. But what do these this generation do? They seek God. They ask God, what should we do? They say, Lord, if you will uh, allow us to conquer these people, then we will, it says we will destroy them. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so they decide to, to give a vow to God. If you help us, Lord, we will completely destroy these cities. And that's what God allows. He, he allows them to, to go in and he helps them to conquer the cities. And then in verse 3, what we see is um, that they destroy all these cities, these towns. And they call a place uh, Homa, which means possibly two things. See, to us, the whole idea of destroying, totally destroying a city sounds horrendous, doesn't it? It's, it's not a, a great image that we want to hold on to. But within the Hebrew kind of way of thinking at that time, that was a way of handing over something to God to completely destroy it. And Horma uh, means either consecration or destruction. And they're pretty much both the same thing within that kind of train of thought. Uh, the idea of it being totally destroyed as giving over to God means that no one else could use it. It was given completely to him. Uh, and so there's this sense of the Israelites saying, look, you know, we will help us get our people back from as uh, who have been taken hostage and we will completely dedicate these places to you. And to do that, they destroyed them. Uh, and so there's the, it's not a kind of violence for its own sake. It has behind a sense of consecration a sense of being given over to God. And so that's that little story. And it's a story of the people of God trying to do the right thing and a story of victory. And it's a story of trusting God. But then we move on to verse four onwards, which is a different type of story, isn't it? Uh, this is about the, the people of God at this point reverting back to type, the grumblers. Uh, and so they are having to uh, wander around Edom, and of course it lengthens the journey. People are starting to lose patience, they're getting uh, tired and weary. Uh, and so they start, as we see in verse 5, to speak against God. And it says explicitly, they spoke against God, against Moses. And we've said a number of times, haven't we, how grumbling can lead to rebellion. Because it takes us on a journey in which we start to see God's ways as being counterproductive and against what we want. Uh, and so they start to grumble and they rebel. And we can see here how this kind of grumbling becomes a habit, doesn't it? Uh, it's, you know, a number of times we've seen it. And grumbling can, can't it? It becomes part of who we are and it seems to, at this point, be part of who the nation are. Uh, and but what we see here is a desire from God for the, his people to be completely holy, to be completely given over to him. In the same way that, um, that the towns and cities are being completely consecrated and destroyed, there is something about our holiness means that our own desires and our own uh, longings, that they are totally destroyed to be succumbed to the will of God. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, as Paul said. And there is something there about the people of God still trying to assert their own will against the will of God. And it even says in verse 5 that they detested uh, the food that God had given them. They had been feeding on manna and quail all this time. The God had just placed it into their lap. Uh, there was nothing they needed to do around this. God provided for them. And it says they detested it. In fact, uh, the King James Version has it this way. Uh, our soul loatheth 
the food. Our soul loathes. I mean, that kind of goes quite deep, doesn't it? That's saying something very strong and perhaps points to the kind of rebellion that the people were uh, were, uh, kind of living out. The very thing that God had given them to sustain them, they now hated. Uh, And then verse 6. We see how the the venom of people's anger is met with venomous snakes. And um, the the kind of the Hebrew word for venom kind of means burning. And so in the King King James Version, you'll see it as fiery serpents. Uh, But more than likely, the bite of these snakes created a burning sensation all the way through the body. And of course, for some people, led to death. And this, this... these snakes, uh, in, in that kind of area, there are lots of reptiles and snakes that have ven- venomous bites. Uh, and these snakes, we don't know which ones they are, could have been any one of them. Um, but God quite often uses just the natural, doesn't he, in unnatural and supernatural ways. And that's what we see here. The things that are already there, God uses. Uh, we see even with the plagues, the, the kind of things that are quite natural in the world, God uses for his own purposes. Uh, Throughout this story, perhaps the only thing that is unnatural that God uses is manna. That is completely a divine intervention. Everything else, God is using what he has already created in nature to bring about his purposes, and in this case, to bring about his judgment. Verse 7, we then see how the people, having experienced something of God's judgment, start to repent. And they they want Moses to intercede on their behalf with God to take the snakes away. But that's not what happens, is it? Moses does intercede and uh, God gives him uh, some strange instructions. He says, uh, you know, make an image of a snake and put it on the pole. And God asking Moses to make a snake must have been a surprise uh, to Moses. But first of all, you know, if you are getting bitten by snakes, what you don't want to do is just make an image of a snake. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? But we also know that God had said in the commandments here to not make images like this. But this is an exception. And so uh, Moses makes this bronze snake. Uh, And whenever people looked, and the snake was suddenly lifted up on a pole like a standard And whenever people looked to the snake, they were healed. And of course, there is the danger here, isn't it, that people see this as some kind of magic. And we also know that um, later on in 2 Kings 18, that King Hezekiah destroys this bronze serpent because people were starting to worship it and make sacrifices to it. Um, And what we don't know about this is... What does to look at the snake actually mean? Does it mean a casual glance or a long, intense stare or or what? We don't know. All we do know is that when people looked at the snake, they were healed. They were restored. So this is not magic. This is simply the mercy of God. This is the mercy of God that stands alongside his holiness. His holiness that that longs for his people to be holy and for sin to be in their hearts, to be cast out. And alongside his holiness, he brings his mercy. He brings forgiveness and restoration. So what does all this mean for us? Uh, So let's go a little bit wider. So the, I think there are a number of applications here for us. And I think the first one, just going back to that first part of the story, is an obvious one. That we should constantly seek God in the big decisions that we make about life. If we seek to simply step into something that God has not ordained, we will be defeated. And that's what we see here. How 38 years earlier they tried to do exactly the same thing and were defeated. And now in this current situation... They ask God, Lord, if you will go with us, if you will enable us to do this, then we will dedicate all these lands to you. And so God helps them to conquer these cities. 
And it's so easy for us, isn't it, to, to just make decisions. Life is filled with decisions. In fact, there's a research that says you can actually get decision fatigue. If you have to make too many decisions each and every day, you just get tired of making decisions and leave yourself in a kind of strange position of not being able to make any more decisions. Some people would say there is a kind of limit that each of us has of how many decisions we can actually make. Life is filled with them. And what I'm not saying is that, you know, you should ask God what breakfast you should have in the morning and those kind of things. But there are things that we should constantly seek God for, about the direction of our lives, about facing the battles that we face, about how we're meant to live each and every day, about who we are meant to spend time with. Those kind of decisions need to be brought to God and we should seek his will in all of those things. The obvious next point is that we should be seeking holiness in our lives. We should be seeking to live a life that is as free from sin as possible. And we all know how easy that sounds, but it is difficult. And I wonder how often we are actually seeking to live lives that glorify God. Lives that are as free from sin as possible. It will never be perfect. You are never going to be a perfectly holy person. You, can, you just need to get to grips with that and accept that. But we should all of us be on a journey to living life that is as free from sin as possible. The kind of sin that affects our motivations and our attitudes and our emotions and our behaviour. All of those things that we know are wrong within us. We need to root out and seek to live lives that are holy. But fortunately we always remember, don't we? That alongside that is the mercy of God who always provides a way out for us. And as I said on Sunday, that way out for us is Jesus. And uh, I, I pointed us on Sunday to a, a passage in, in the New Testament that talks about how, in the same way that Moses lifted up the snake and people were healed, that we too can look at Jesus as he is lifted up and be saved. And I think on Sunday I got the uh, the reference wrong. I described it as St. Paul. It's actually Jesus who said this in John 3. Just before that, the most famous verse of all, that God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just before that, Jesus says that in the same way as Moses lifted up the snake, that when the Son of Man is lifted up, whoever believes in him, would have life. And so we're reminded of the mercy of God here. And it doesn't matter, as I said on Sunday, how you've lived your life, what you've done wrong, you can look to Jesus and find salvation and you can find healing and you can find wholeness and you can find a future. The next thing I want to just pick up on is how the Israelites had this habit of grumbling. And uh, in this Lent season that we're in at church, we are encouraging you to develop a, a habit of gratitude. And they are both like th things on, on a scale, aren't they? At one end, you've got grumbling, and at the other end, you've got gratitude. And we need to constantly be working towards the one end of gratitude. So that instead of grumbling about the things that God has given us, we are grateful for them. I wonder if the Israelites were ever grateful for the manner that they received. I'm sure they were on that first day. But did they simply just take it for granted in the end? Did they simply just accept it as this is what our life is like? and ignore the fact that it came from God as a supernatural divine act. And they forgot to be grateful and thankful. And I think all too often, you know, the things that God gives us personally, that God has done for each of us personally to sustain us. I wonder if we ever get to that point where like the Israelites loathe manna, we loathe those things. We, we can kind of just get complacent about what God has done for us. 
And we need to learn how to be grateful for it. We need to develop thankfulness for all that God has given us. And he's given us so much. So what is your habit? Do you naturally tend towards gratitude or do you naturally tend towards grumbling? None of us want to be in that place, do we? So I would encourage you in this Lent season to to practice gratitude, to, to develop an attitude that is looking for what God has done and just saying, yeah, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for all that you've given me. The other point I want to just bring up is this, that the people of Israel went to Moses to intercede on their behalf. And I want to remind you again that we don't need another person to intercede for us. Jesus is our intercessor. He is the one who speaks into our lives and speaks to the Father on our behalf. We do not need someone to stand in between us and him. And so whenever you are struggling with things, whenever you know that you need to to turn away from sin in your life, you can just come to Jesus and know that he will be there to restore you, forgive you, heal you. And no matter what snakes you face in your life right now, whatever it is that is threatening you, you can come to Jesus. You don't need to go to anyone else. You just go to Jesus. You may need someone to help you to get to Jesus, but that's all. You can go to Jesus on your own. I say, Lord, help me. Give me peace. And so I want to encourage you in, in this season of Lent to keep looking to Jesus and to find your salvation and your healing and your peace and your forgiveness in him. So let's just think about some questions uh, for you to consider in uh, your groups, in your mission communities or on your own. So let's go a little bit further. So we always like to uh, finish with four or five questions for you to consider. And um, the first question is this, uh, and so just a general question. What is the, the key point that you want to take from this passage to apply to your own life? Just a very simple, general uh, question. The second question is this. Uh, before I talked about kind of that grumbling gratitude scale, you know, grumbling one end, gratitude the other, where are you on that scale? And is that is that kind of point at which you're at? Is it moving in any direction? Are you becoming more of a grumbler? Or are you becoming uh, more filled with gratitude? I can't think of a way of putting that any better. Which way are you moving? How are you going to move towards gratitude? In the things that we've talked about in this uh, practicing gratitude season, what are you learning to help you become more grateful for what God has given you? The third thing is this. At this point, the Israelites are starting to learn the lessons that they've picked up in 38 years of wandering the desert it's still slow <laughs> i mean they, they, they are slow learners these guys but they are learning the lessons they sought god on how to conquer the king of arad and i wonder in the battles that you are in right now and we're all in battles of some kind aren't we are you learning the lessons that god wants you to learn and what are those lessons? I'd love you to share it with others so that you can kind of think it out and to, to process it out loud, but also for them to learn from your battles. What are you learning in the battles that you are in right now? And the final question is this, in what areas of your life do you need to look to Jesus for your salvation? Maybe in those battles that you're in, you're just trying to fight them on your own, Maybe there are fears and anxieties that you're facing right now and you're trying to deal with them in your own way. How are you going to look to Jesus in those battles? Are you in danger of looking to other people to help you? Are you in danger 
of trying to find your own way forward instead of looking to Jesus. Let me encourage you to think that through and to talk it over with others. There are times when we do need to, to go to other people, when we need advice, when we need support, when we need medical help, you know, those kind of things. But ultimately, we look to Jesus. How are you doing that right now? So there you go, four quick questions for you to consider. Do please uh, join us on Sunday as we continue our wilderness wanderings. Uh, and as you probably know by now, uh, this Sunday we are opening up the church building again for worship. Uh, we will still have an online presence and we'll have the physical presence in the church as well. And so you'll be able to worship in whichever way you feel appropriate at this moment. Uh, so do please join us then. And if not, join us next Tuesday uh, uh, for our next edition of Deeper. So until then, stay safe. And I'll see you then.